Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. My name is Jeff. And my name is Dustin. And today we're going to answer your questions. But first, I have a question. Dustin, how are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, (laughs) uh, Made waffles for my fiance for Mother's Day. It's her second Mother's Day. And she's super excited. Uh, got the cool. baby in the front room all covered in syrup. So we're good. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So a couple things, listeners. We have a very special guest, as you heard, Dustin, frequent contributor, Dustin. Uh, so welcome, Dustin. Thank you. Um, also, we are recording this on Mother's Day. So yeah, it was it was Mother's Day for all of us. So happy Mother's Day a <laughs> couple weeks afterwards. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jeff, how you doing? Uh, I'm doing all right. Uh, just finished finished recovering from my second dose of the vaccine so yeah same here um, yeah i'm i'm doing a lot better than i was uh a day and a half ago <laughs> sure yeah um i was expecting to be i've heard lots of people say that they were like completely wiped out the day after but um the day after i was pretty much fine like i was a little groggy in the morning but once i was up and about i i actually felt better than i felt most days <laughs> Yeah, no, I I got it real rough. Skylar yeah. got it pretty rough too, but she slept. You know, she was able to sleep through most of it. I was sure. not so lucky. <laughs> so, Sherry yep. was pretty good on the first dose, but the second dose wiped her out. I just had sore shoulders like days after. Sure. Yeah. So, but still, still worth it. It was just it was more severe than I was expecting, but not mm-hmm. not all entirely unexpected. Yeah. So maybe in a couple of weeks we'll need to, uh, maybe we don't, we don't need to go back to doing in-person recordings every week, but maybe we could do like an episode or a bonus episode or something. Right. In person. Yeah. I think yeah. that'd be cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Dustin, thank you for coming on the show. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Do you want to maybe just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Maybe tell us how you got into tabletop gaming, uh, anything else you want to tell them? Yeah. Um, I am a med school student, uh, I got into gaming um, actually in college. Uh, An email went around asking for players. Uh, My soon-to-be friend Ricky was looking for players for a uh, 3.5 game then. Mm -hmm. Uh, My roommate wanted to go, so he brought me along. And then I basically had a group of friends that we played 3.5, 4.0, and now 5. So... You know, we, cool. our longest game was a 3.5 game that lasted three years continuously. Wow. That's, that's impressive. Nice. So, yeah, as as I said earlier, like you've contributed a ton of stuff to the show over the years. And so we're always, always happy to get uh, submissions from Dustin. Yeah, I yeah. just get bored and write. <laughs> <laughs> What, yeah, pretty yeah. much. I mean, we're this... more than we're more than happy to read them on, on the show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You guys want to go ahead and just kind of jump into the episode? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, Jeff, mm-hmm. you are standing in line at the supermarket to buy the latest issue of Turtles Quarterly. Oh, yeah. All right. You reach into <laughs> your pocket to pull out your wallet. Oh, no. It's not there. Oh, oh no. no. You, you know where you left it? Well, oh, shoot. Where did I leave it? In the Dragon's Horde. <laughs> As we've established previously, the your neighbor is a dragon, so you were probably yeah. you stopped over at your neighbor's house to you know hang out or something. <laughs> right, yeah. in your pocket. Uh, you know. No, he drove me to the market. Yeah, there oh, you go. that's car. So, so does he drive his horde around? Yeah, that's the name of his car. <laughs> okay. It's like one of those painted panel vans. <laughs> oh sure yeah 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 absolutely like yeah yeah you open yep. up the sli- sliding side door and there's just like piles of gold in there yeah because you know it was in the 80s or whatever the, the like the the tough guy would always have a van with like a water bed in it right. and sure. this dragon just he keeps his bed which is a giant pile there of coins you go. in the van <laughs> we we solved it yeah we figured it out <laughs> Oh, now I have to do the magic item of the painted wizard that's on the side of the van. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Dustin, you brought in uh, a magic item today? Yeah, it is it is the carapist horn. Okay. The war horn is a common sight on the battlefield, summoning allies to arms. 
one in need need never feel overwhelmed by an oncoming horde when help is easily called. This lacquered black pronged horn is sculpted to resemble the head of a Hercules beetle. Once per day, this horn may be used to call all beetles within 15 miles. Yeah. The called beetles will coalesce into 1d8 plus 2 beetle swarms. These swarms may then be given the commands stay, guard, move, or attack. These swarms disperse after 10 minutes or after enough damage is done to destroy each one. Doof. There you go. So yeah, it's a, a horn that summons a whole bunch of beetles. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You you, me you mentioned your uh, uh, before the show. You mentioned your uh, inspiration for this item uh, was basically just like the number of animals within a certain. Yep. You know, just your chances of getting attacked by any 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 creature that's within a certain amount of uh, you know miles from you or whatever. But yeah, if like we don't think about just like our day to day how close how many bugs are within like a certain radius of us at all times like there yeah. are so many bugs on the planet yeah you know like if yeah if you were to just summon all bugs within a even a mile radius it would be a ridiculous swarm is it uh, Hopper from Bugs Life? Is goes those ants outnumber us a hundred to one, and if they ever right. figured this out, <laughs> right, right, yeah, Bugs yeah. Life. <laughs> um, according to Google, recent figures indicate there are more than two hundred million insects for each human on the planet. Right. Oh, I, yeah. I, maybe I need to do two d eight. Right. My, <laughs> yeah, might need to be uh, bigger, <laughs> more swarms. Yeah. 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 But yeah, no, there's there's a lot of bugs. Yeah, a... 300 pounds of insects for every pound of humans. <laughs> that's, that's, that's that's pretty. That's, that's pretty... disgusting. No, come on, bugs are bug. Some bugs are cute. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> this item makes me think of back in third edition. There was a spell called I think it was called Creeping Doom. I believe it existed in 3.5, but they changed it quite a bit and it wasn't as cool in, in 3.5. Uh. But I believe what it did was in third edition, it created a swarm of 1000 insects in a 10 foot, 10 foot radius spread. They could move really slowly. They couldn't really move very, very quickly at all. But you basically, you summoned this gigantic mass of a thousand insects and you could move them and have them Swarm somebody. Each one dealt one point of damage. <laughs> so, in theory, you could use it to deal 1,000 hit points worth of damage. It was a 7th or 8th level spell. Uh, yeah, Druid level 7, Animal 8. Yeah. And they changed it in, in 3.5 to instead be like, oh, you summon a bunch of swarms. But that was so much less cool to me than, no, I'm doing 1,000 points of damage. By summoning all these things. Now, like, of course, if they had any form of damage reduction, each one was only dealing one point. Yeah. So they would take no damage in that case. But still, like, it was a really cool, really cool spell. And so with this item, it, it kind of makes me think of that because it's summoning all of the beetles within 15 miles. And so I'm picturing just <laughs> yeah. a giant carpet of beetles running up from the distance and swarming over whatever. Yeah. yeah, and that kind of brings up one thing that I I, I kind of miss about 3.5 is that yeah. there's a lot of creatures that had, like, their specific damage resistances. And I don't just mean, like, oh, resistance to all non-magical items, but, like, sure. skeletons had, like, piercing resistance. If mm -hmm. swarms had, I think, piercing resistance, you had to, like, do area attacks or burn them or something. And I think a lot yeah. of that is lost because now it's just like, oh, what does my uh, sword do? Oh, it just does slashing piercing. But like in the past, you had to have like one sword for this group. And then I had like a hammer on the side because lo and behold, you turn the corner and there's a whole bunch of skeletons and all you have is a rapier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We actually came across that in our, in our Pathfinder game where because uh, that Pathfinder second edition does have this still kind of have that. What Jay was saying was that it's not necessarily that they have resistance to one thing. It's that they have weakness to another. Yeah, he was like, you'll, uh, something will have like more hit points 
but will have a but will take extra damage from one particular type of of damage. Yeah, which is like, yeah, that's a cool way to balance. That's a cool way to balance it because it's just that way you don't have to like you don't have to do the math for every attack. You just have to add the extra damage when the right type of attack happens. Sure. And yeah, looking at like a swarm of beetles in fifth edition, yeah, it's it's just bl- resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing, which. Okay, I, I guess. Yeah. But it was so much cooler when they were immune to effects that targeted a specific number of creatures. Yeah, because like, it's like that, if you're slashing at a, you know, a swarm of bees, like... Yeah. But you, you say spells that target a specific number of creatures. The only one that comes to mind is, like, sleep spell. Are you trying to put ants to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, like, magic missile wouldn't affect a swarm. In oh, third edition, sense, magic yeah. missile wouldn't affect a swarm. Swinging a sword wouldn't attack a, a, a swarm unless it was an area attack. Yeah. That sort of thing. Uh, yeah. So, so yeah, this this item, it's relatively simple mechanics-wise. Yeah. Just, you know, you summon a whole bunch. Of, you summon 1d8 plus 2 beetle swarms, and then you can give them various uh, commands. Mm. Um, but uh, I love the theming. I love just the image of summoning all of the beetles within 15 miles. Yeah. The other right. thing I like about this one is that mm-hmm. there's a lot of magic items that are very powerful and tend to be shifted towards the higher end of the tier list so you have like the holy avenger the the floating sword all that kind of stuff where it's like you don't give it to like a third level guy this is something because you're only summoning like one eighth cr little things you know which will turn the tide in lower levels but when you're up against 15th level stuff it's gonna do nothing yeah my that most might cause a distraction yeah (laughs) I also really like how it's a horn that is looks like the head of a of a Hercules beetle. Yeah, it has basically a, a big scoop up horn from the bottom that it kind of has another one that scoops down from the top of its head. Yeah, okay, okay. Yep. Yep. Well, thank you very much Dustin for bringing that in. Once again, that was the carapist horn uh submitted by Dustin here on the podcast and on Discord. So thank oh. you Dustin. Uh Jeff, if anybody else wanted to submit magic items for the Dragon's Horde, or if they wanted to submit questions for us to discuss, or stories for the funeral pyre, or whatever else we're doing with our final segment, how could they get those to us? They can send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com, or join us on our interparty discord at bit.ly slash interpartydiscord. There you go. Uh, Dustin, do you have anywhere that uh, you would like our listeners to know how to contact you? So you can follow me on Twitter at at medschooldaddy, M-E-D, school daddy. Uh, yep, only on Twitter. Don't look for it elsewhere. I'm not there. <laughs> okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, so before we go any further, we have a giveaway to give <gasps> away today. Ooh. As usual, we're giving away a copy of three or more supplements from Crit Academy, in particular the Warmind Cleric Domain. The Skybreaker Fighter Archetype and the Werecat Player Race, uh, courtesy of Crit Academy, the great guys from the Crit Academy podcast. So, Jeff, who is our winner of these supplements today? Our winner today is Jeff R. Whoa, 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 winner. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Yes, congratulations, Jeff R. You should be getting that in your email pretty soon. If you haven't gotten anything in a week, let us know. Um, and be sure to uh, leave Crit Academy a review for each of these products. Let them know what you think so that they can get more attention and also they can uh, they can know what to work on in the future so they can keep on making better products. So yeah, go check them out. Uh, thank you so much, Crit Academy, for facilitating this giveaway. It's so awesome. Justin's always willing to give out cool stuff. And uh, as he said when they were on a, a few weeks ago, he's apparently sending out a bunch of other stuff on top of these three supplements. So so good on him. Yeah. And of, of course, bonuses. congratulations, Jeff R. Cool. Jeff, if anybody else wanted to enter this drawing, they wanted to be like Jeff R and win a free copy of these great supplements. How could they enter the drawing? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com with crit three in the subject line. That's correct. Do you love interparty conflict? You know, the show you're listening to right now. Yeah! Then check out their Patreon at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. You can help support the show and get tons of bonus content, too. Access hundreds of outtakes, dozens of short stories, periodic updates about the the behind-the-scenes of the show, personalized media, a monthly Roll20 game run by Gabe himself, and more. Every month, green and red-tier patrons get access to the bonus podcast, Interpatron Conflict, 
where Gabe and Jeff cover a wide variety of topics. Join right now and access the most recent episode, which might sound a little something like this. I saw me slide it to him. He saw me slide it to him. But it just was not there. Um, It just snap disappeared. So we were both completely confused because we both saw that I had handed it to him. Um, I tore that desk apart. Uh, He looked all over the floor where he was. I looked in crevices I didn't even know existed. Um, And as far as I know, that card was never found. It just glitched out of the matrix. (laughs) Right, yeah. It could have just been like a crack crack in the wood of the table or something that it just slid into. But here's the thing. When we broke that table down because we were moving to a crappy building. Right. I mean, I worked there then. I still remembered that incident as I do now. (laughs) I was there when we took that desk apart. There was no library card. It, it's it's people needed it. It had to. It had to, <laughs> <laughs> it had to be somewhere else. That yeah. library card died on its way to its home planet. Right. <laughs> Once again, go to Patreon.com/slash/InterpartyConflict to help out the show and access all that bonus content today. And then let me just uh, remind everybody to check out the other podcasts on the Crit Nation Fellowship. Check out Crit Academy, CritAcademy.com. Justin, Ian, and Austin make new and reusable content for players and DMs alike. Check out uh, Brute Force and Ignorance just started coming out with more episodes. They were on hiatus for a very long time. Mm. So check them out. They're an actual play podcast on the network. Uh, D&D Character Lab, they made like, they had like a little bit of a, of a reunion. I don't think... They are still continuing to come out with it. Whatever they're doing, check them out. D&D Character Lab, Garen and Dan made characters and debated against each other about their characters. And of course, check out the Kind GM podcast, which is another advice podcast for uh, for Game Masters and Dungeon Masters. So enough of all that. Let's get into this episode, Jeff and Dustin. All right. Our first question comes from Sean M. on Facebook, and they ask... How would you integrate a PC with a disability into your game without just eliminating that disability? And not just blindness, but missing limbs or using a wheelchair, etc. Yeah, because I, I feel like a lot of uh, a lot of the time the first reaction is just going to be, oh, you're blind? Well, I'll just give you a thing that makes you able to see. Or you have a limb, sure. I'll just give you a robotic limb. Or, or something like that. Um, so yeah, what are some ways to incorporate that without just eliminating it? I th- I think it's almost the wrong question because okay. uh, the question kind of puts the disability at the center, like that's their character, like they are disabled. And I think sure. the thing that makes a great many characters good is that the disability is a trait they have, but that's not their character. Like mm-hmm. if you look at, you know, through media through the years, like Long John Silver, known as the man with one leg, but he's the pirate lord. And that's sure. what he is. Like he he walks around with a crutch, and he actually uses that crutch to his advantage sometimes to catch people off guard. You know, like he, the, you could have somebody using a crutch uh, who has a bonus to like persuasion and like deception and stuff because they don't seem to be that dangerous. You know, how can a man with one leg be dangerous? You know, mm, sure. <laughs> the it seen from Two Towers where it's Gandalf uh, going to go talk to the. Uh, uh, King of Rohan. Yeah, and and they're like, we're you know they're like, we gotta take we gotta take your weapons, we gotta take your staff, and he's like, oh oh, you wouldn't you wouldn't take an old man's walking stick, would you? But no, it's like it's a wizard staff. Yeah, like, sure. he's he's gonna do some he's gonna do something with that. Yeah. yeah. So I I think what you're getting at, Dustin, is that if 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 the core of the character is I'm a character with a disability. Yeah. That's a bad starting point. Yeah. If if you have a character that one of their many, you know, one of the many traits that make up that character is a disability of some kind, that's a much better starting yeah. point. As a person that does not have a disability, at least I don't think anything that most people would call a, a disability, um, I feel like it is sometimes it's it's sometimes my first reaction to think of that as being the core concept of a character and that's something i need to get out of i need to get out of that mindset i need to view them as a character a character first and then you know again with multiple 
traits to that character, one of which is the disability. They aren't that isn't their character. They are a character, and that's just one part of them. Cause then if you have a character whose like core concept is like one of the ideas I had was a gnome thief wizard, right? Mm-hmm. He has no legs. So he always looks like he's, you know, always defenseless and everything. But then you look at the weight needed for Tensor's floating disc. This guy can hover around all the places he wants, <laughs> right? Sure. And could totally end up places where you would not expect him to be because he has sure. no legs, you know? And <laughs> just, or a, a wizard with no arms or anything who's uh, a spell thief that always uses um, a modified version of Mage Hand. Sure. So he's always doing like stuff on the side, but his main thing is I have no arms. I can't lift things. I can't, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, and so you could always explore these weird avenues of like edge cases where, okay, he's good. He can move around places because he has this spell. But what happens when he's in the situation where he has to choose between mobility with Tensor's floating disc, but he really needs this very specific spell to get through the next level? Like, how does he do that? Like, you know, so you have the interesting choice for a player, you know? Sure. Or what happens if he suddenly gets in an anti-magic zone? You know, does he yeah, now have to, yeah. you know, hang off the back of the barbarian and cast spells from his back while the barbarian tries to, you know, keep him from getting splashed? You know, sure. Although I'm wondering if their question is trying to ask, like, mechanically, how do you how do you integrate it? Okay. Um. So, like, what one of the like uh, common examples would be like the blind swordsman kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Sure. You know, the blind swordsman, blind samurai, or whatever. As a DM, would you want them to have some sort of mechanical difference? I mean, obviously, there is going to be some difference in like certain situations, like you know, obvi- like you know, they they can't see, they're blind. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. does the player want that just to just because they want that that to be the the cool blind swordsman, or do they do they are they do they actually want to have that penalty, and do they want something in return for it? You know, they take they're sure. taking a flaw to get something cool in return. Yeah. Like, you know, like, you know, they have really good hearing, so they, they get a bonus to detecting something just based on their hearing. So, like, they'll, you know, like I, I forget exactly how it works in, like, 5th edition stuff, but, like, you know, if you're trying to figure out where something is and you can't, and you're blinded, like, is, is it, is it just disadvantage? I think like so, yeah. because I, I think, um... I think in fifth edition, I think it is just disadvantage, and then like you can't target things that like if there's like an, an NPC, if they are hiding from you, you also can't target them. Hmm. Um, so yeah, because I I think part of it is that like it is assumed that you're using other senses as well when you're uh, making perception checks and stuff. You can still make a perception check; it's just at disadvantage. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that's something you could work out on a character by character basis. Because there are sure. a lot of uh, TTRPGs that work off the the blessing flaw concept, where like you have so many points for your character, but if you take a flaw, you can get a few extra, you know, points to put somewhere else. Yeah. So you know, a flaw might be. I think in White Wolf they have stuff where, um, for the glass walkers, which are like the ones who are in normal human society and go down, they have to have a piece of technology on them at all times. You mm-hmm. know, it allows them to get more points, but if they ever lose that piece of technology, they get a negative. So you could do sure. things like that where they're taking a deficit from or um, not having an arm, being blind, not having legs. So they should get a bonus in something else that obviously makes sense so if you're blind you're probably better at hearing if you're a one-armed swordsman you're probably really really good at one wheel you know one handing a sword because you only practice with one hand but Mm -hmm. you're obviously not going to be able to carry a shield sure so i actually i i found when sean m submitted this question i think that i i might have actually oversimplified it a little bit so i mean we can still talk about it uh, what we've been talking about, but let me just read uh, Sean M's original submission so that I can I can maybe represent a little bit more also of what Sean M was asking. So, uh, so Sean said, 
Uh, my friend and I are, ha- are discussing something after I had a thought about players with disabilities being reflected in the PCs of the game. Let's say you play for new people you haven't met and you find that one of them is blind and another's in a wheelchair. How do you represent them in the game without simply hand-waving their disability? I've thought before about how a character born with an incomplete limb could never have restoration magic restore something that didn't exist. That's for an NPC. The player can have whatever they want. But how does a blind PC work without simply giving them daredevil-like blind sense, which itself breaks the game? Or how do you have a wheelchair-bound PC function without simply giving them fly? Um, and they also gave some examples, which if you don't, guys don't mind, I will, I will give the examples that, that Sean gave. Uh, blind PC gets the blind fighter feat ability from Tasha's. This started the conversation with my friend and I. But this comes from the party patron in the form of a bandana that covers the eyes. The player could eventually develop the, with the rest of the party with additional features. I would also give them a default booster advantage on listening or smelling over the typical 120 feet or so of the typical visual perception checks. Even there, advantage could be seen as an issue, though, since it hand waves the blindness. So maybe it's good to develop that skill into a PC when they become, say, third level, and they are that much more extraordinary. The wheelchair thing can be tough. Perhaps the PC is in a chair. As a DM, dungeon stairs can become ramps, and any part with a ladder gets a rope and a pulley, much like some barns have to haul things through their upper floors. Forest terrain can get tougher. How do you overcome difficult terrain? Regular casual walking can be simply slightly bumpy ground. I've thought enchanting a chair with a hover fly speed that has a limit of minutes based on character level. Maybe that's a good place to start and offers interesting scenarios where the chair bump person is the hero. But how do you start an adventure with this to give the player the same feel that they too are an early adventurer and the fantastic stuff gets added in later? So there's actually kind of a lot there. I yeah. We got this in uh, several months ago, so I, I can understand why I kind of simplified it. Yeah. But yeah, you could, mm-hmm. let's say somebody is playing a uh, a character that is in a wheelchair. And actually, I will say that there have been official sources recently. Mm-hmm. There was a uh, Wizards of the Coast adventure, I think, where one of the characters in was in a chair. Or maybe I'm remembering that wrong. But they're, they're starting to include characters like that in official artwork, which I think is a great a move, a great move in the right direction. Because it's not just acting like everybody is the same cookie cutter type of human being. Right. So if you're going to give a a character a a wheelchair, how do you, number one, make it so that they can still do things that the rest of the party can do, but number two, without making them either too powerful or really not fun to play? Uh, And actually, you kind of sparked something in my head that... We're dealing with fantastical worlds. So you have the high steampunk magic of Eberron, but you can also have, you know, all the way down to near realism of Lord of the Rings. Like there's a lot of magic and stuff going on, but a lot of the stuff is we're walking through a mine, you know, we need torches for light. So I think the first step is determining how high magic technology your world is. And then kind of determine, okay, you have a person in this world. What do they as a person have access to? Right? Because if you have a artificer who gets a hold of a, you know, wheelchair, he's going to put spider legs on that thing and it's going to walk up walls. Right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's going to take a lot of effort and, you know, stuff. But I'm sure there's a spell for it. I'm sure there's a thing. It's going to cost a lot of money. And probably a lot of people aren't going to be able to afford that. But... There are riding dogs, there are horses, there are carts, you know, Mm -hmm. so there's that kind of rustic approach where you can totally, you know, strap a man with no legs to the back of a horse, give him a lance, and boom, there you go, you know. Sure. So I think in some ways you're, you're, we were kind of thinking mechanically and taking ourselves a bit out of like the mythos of the world. And I think- Okay. If you think inside the world, there's a lot of answers there that you can go interesting places with, like the idea of uh, you're a, a first level adventurer or something, and you're trying to get a item that gives you blind sight. But what are you really going to be able to afford at that point? You're probably, you know, not going to be able to go into the main magic shop and buy the brand new, you know, cloth of blind sight and seeing. <laughs> You're probably going to go sure. to Ed's, you know, knockoffs down the street 
and what what's that bandana going to do for you? Maybe maybe every so often, like it just doesn't work, or you see things that aren't there, or you're really seeing things that are in the next dimension over, and then you have trouble with that. <laughs> and then that bandana can, as things evolve, suddenly give you more, you know interesting plot hooks because now you're seeing things that aren't there but you're seeing like part of the astral dimension you know so sure. you can have little story things that lead from like where are they getting these items to get help inside the world yeah hmm. um, i do think that uh finding ways to make plot out of it or to to make it uh into plot hooks is a good move like i mean i would say even to a point go ahead and give the player a you know a, a wheelchair that lets them move around just as easily as anybody else but it takes some sort of a magical resource to power so every now and then you have to go on an adventure to go get some of that yeah or like you were saying dustin you have this uh this bandana that lets you see but sometimes you see things that you aren't supposed to be seeing and so that can lead to you know investigating that can lead to more adventure as well so like i i would i think it's probably fine to allow the players to mechanically all be on the same playing field, but use the story to keep them remembering that they aren't just a person with a disability. They are a person that has a, a different type of options, I guess, yeah. if that makes any sense. And at the core of it, it is a fantasy world. So we can break yeah. a lot of the, the common rules and we don't just have to relegate them to what we have access to in the real world. One thing I want to mention is that a long time ago, Crit Academy, it, they had an episode. It was episode 46. So Ooh. this was about almost four years ago. Actually, this episode came out on my wedding anniversary, October oh, 4th. Uh, so episode... <laughs> thank, well, <laughs> thank you very much, I guess. So uh, episode 46 of Crit Academy was about... It was called Blind Adventuring. And they had a guest on who was blind. Or who is blind. And uh, he talked about, I believe he talked, it's been a long time since I've listened to that episode, but he talked about some of the, you know, the obstacles being a blind player and also some of the ways to improve the game and, and so on and so on. So that's definitely something to go and check out because that's something I'd never thought of before listening to that episode. Yeah. I'll <laughs> put a link in the show notes whenever our show notes are back up again because blogger is being stupid right now but uh yeah so episode 46 of crit academy it's definitely something to something to check out if you're interested in figuring out you know what what sort of stuff is out there for stuff like this so i mean i guess to summarize the to answer the question i guess remember that the character is more than just a disability they are a person and you know one or more disabilities are just one or more of the many facets of that character it's an okay starting point if you think to yourself, I want to play a character that, you know, is blind or is missing a limb or something. It's an okay starting point for the character. It's not a good end point for the character. Don't just say, all right, they have a disability. All right, character's done, you know. Yeah. Um, and then as far as like integrating that sort of stuff into the world, like Dustin said, it's it's a fantasy world. So there's lots of, you know, there's things that, that can be in the game, things that can be in the world. So... Be sure to, you know, find ways to make more game out of it, I guess. And I guess, like, giving the character, like, a magical item or something like that to, like, make up for the disability, like, that, in most cases, that's not going to be overpowering in any way, because, like, what is anybody else going to use that for? Sure. You know, I like, have twice the sight. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they, they, they start seeing double and they get dizzy or something, I don't know. I, they, have, they, they actually get disadvantaged because then they're like, they only have half the chance of hitting the thing they're targeting oh, because they see, see it twice. Sure. I'm seeing double four crusties. <laughs> well, I've got two crossbows. Oh. <laughs> One for each of you. All right. Our next question comes from not actually Kyle on discord. Have you ever role played a mentally challenged person? And should that even be attempted? If so, what are your tips and suggestions for doing so respectfully? Yeah. So have you, have either of you ever played a character that uh, had a, a discrete mental disability? I think the most I've ever done is I had a character who had a severe stutter. Okay. Um, sure. So I think that's as far as I've gone with that. Um, yeah. I, yeah. I can't, I can't think of anything specific. 
Yeah, um, I don't think I've ever played a character that did. But the thing is, when this when this question was first uh, submitted, I tried to think like a lot of players give their characters specific symptoms of of mental disabilities without it discreetly or or specifically being caused by a mental disability. Like a lot of the time, like uh, Drax from. Uh, from Guardians of the Galaxy, always takes things literally. I've seen players, you know, play their characters like that. Mm -hmm. I've seen players play their characters really, like, socially awkward or, like Dustin said, with a stutter or just really unintelligent or only, you know, unintelligent in certain fields while they're, they're, uh, you know, very unintelligent in other fields and so on. I just, I feel like a lot of the time you get characters that have mental disabilities or mental conditions or whatever that just aren't called that. They still have all of the symptoms or some of the symptoms or whatever. And so I'm wondering, is anything gained by actually calling it a mental disability or is it just, oh, my character is just really particular in that way? Mm. Mm. I think you actually just summarized a lot of what I was going to say is oh. that there are there's the DSM five is the current one. It's basically the manual of definitions for mental disabilities, and sure. there have been five iterations. And in that, they have changed a lot of the labels that they apply to people. Like you have ADD, ADHD, you know, ADHD hyperactive variant. Uh, you had. Yeah. Autism used to be its own thing. Now it's an autism spectrum. Mm -hmm. And the big thing to take away from this is that it is very hard to pin down what exactly is the definition for any specific mental disability. And I sure. think if you attempted to play someone who was just mentally disabled or autistic or something, you would kind of lead yourself almost inexorably towards a stereotype. Yeah. And so instead, mm -hmm. doing what I think most people do is take a trait of that or a symptom of that and then iterate on that. And that, to me, feels more real, more genuine, and less likely to be, you know, perceived to be disrespectful because, mm -hmm. you know, you're not trying to stereotype the group you're not trying to say oh this is what all people have it's i have a character that just happens to have this particular symptom because sure. uh my niece and my nephew are both on the spectrum uh mm -hmm. my niece more so um she is almost nonverbal. she has um very specific um patterns of the day that she has to go through if other people are eating, she has to eat too, um, which is why if you're eating and it's not mealtime, you have to hide the fact that you're eating from her or otherwise she gets upset because things are in the wrong order. Uh, oh. At one point, I made the mistake. I was babysitting her and she pointed to her jacket. I thought she was cold. I gave her the jacket. She then became upset because jacket means we're leaving and oh. we weren't leaving. Uh, so you have that end of the spectrum, which could... Uh, the rituals of that could very easily lead into a wizard that has to do ritual magic, not because that's all they know, but because that's what makes them comfortable. And so mm -hmm. they have, like, all their spells are utility, all their spells are ritual, because that's what they do. But then you can also go to the other end of it, towards the Drax side of it, where they are high-functioning, they can talk, they're verbal, but they don't understand social situations. And that could very easily you know, be played as a a barbarian who is a normal person grown up in society, but they don't understand social situations. So they can't tell when they're not supposed to be loud. They can't tell when okay. they're not supposed to be doing things that like they're doing things that make themselves comfortable, but they're in public doing it. You know, so you could have that barbarian feel, but you're couching it in the idea that they don't understand social circles. If you're having sure. uh, something like schizophrenia, you know, the the main thing is you have you hear voices that other people don't hear, you see things that other people don't see. That to me sounds like a warlock. Okay. You know, he's got a patron. Nobody else sees his patron. 
nobody else hears his patron, you know, but he's getting instructions from somebody nobody else can see. You know, so you could totally play that up both story-wise and mechanically, but because we've now sorted down this is what my traits are, you know, you can kind of almost anchor that character into something kind of like the was it the ideals the traits and the bonds yeah you know yeah. so you have that but you have one extra that's like flaws or like that i think there I mean, is well, flaws. Flaws, are, flaws yeah is flaws are already part of it but you know like you could almost put it in flaws like they don't understand social situations which come mm-hmm. to think of it my last character professor von guggenheim <laughs> that was yeah. his flaw he didn't understand social situations sure but i think that would really bring down but one thing I should say, as with anything dealing with new mechanics, new characters, you should always bring it up to your table members. Like, yeah. say, this is my character. This is what I'm doing with it. Does anybody have a problem with it? Because if you're the first one to lay it on the table, no one's going to sit there in the sidelines and stew on you. Because you don't want to make somebody you silently uncomfortable and then they come to resent you and then they just leave the group. You know? Sure. Yeah. So you mm-hmm. say it right at the beginning, I'm going to play a schizophrenic warlock. Does anybody have a problem with that? You know, and maybe have a backup bard. who knows? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Cause, cause yeah, the, this sort of thing, you do want to be careful that you, you, you know, you don't want, you don't want to be disrespectful or offensive yeah. or anything like that. The, the idea isn't to, make the stereo make fun of the stereotypes or to make light of disability it's more just a it's just ideas for characters it's nothing you know don't play a mentally disabled person because you want to do a funny voice or something sure like yeah. don't yeah don't don't do that like but if you just if you wanted this interesting interesting trait added to your character you have something re- in that that exists in real life to you know to work with yeah and yeah i think a big a big part of uh the reason to avoid it is like dustin said you don't want to you don't want to be a stereotype mm-hmm. um there is so there's a there's a tv show called archer mm-hmm. it's about it's a an animated tv show about the spy agency and i haven't watched it in several years but um i watched the first you know three or four seasons and eventually i started seeing discussion about the main character sterling archer and people pointing out that they think that he has borderline personality disorder it's never stated in the show it's just he's written to have a bunch of very particular behaviors and he you know the way that he deals with people and the way that he deals with various situations a lot of people have said that this very much seems like the behaviors of someone who has borderline personality disorder if the show ever made it explicit if they ever said yes he does have borderline personality disorder to me it would feel like it's not okay anymore it, it would feel like they're just doing a caricature or or uh, a stereotype of someone with this mental disability mm-hmm. whereas if it's just he just has a bunch of weird traits or a bunch of you know traits that get in the way of the things he does or that affect how he deals with people and so on. If it's not made explicit, it's just part of the character. It's just part of the character's personality. Mm -hmm. But once it does have the label of, oh, it's this particular disorder, then it does start to feel like it's crossed a line to me. Maybe not for everybody, but to me, it would feel different if they did make that explicit. So similarly, if someone did play, if so, here's, here's, here's what I'm getting at, Dustin. If somebody came to me and said, I want to play a warlock who's schizophrenic, my initial gut reaction would be like, I don't, that doesn't sound good to me at all. But if it was instead, I want to play a character that has this symptom, this symptom, and this symptom, even if it was all the symptoms of someone with schizophrenia, that would feel more palatable to me because I would be less afraid that it's going to be a stereotype. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's just me prejudging people. Maybe I should give more people a chance. I don't know. But uh, I don't know. I, I think a big part of it is the presentation. Yeah. If it's presented as a set of symptoms rather than a disorder, you know, it, it's more palatable to me. And that kind of leads back to what I said, where like it's a conversation that you need to have before game, like a session yes. zero thing. So 
if anybody has any objections, you can, you know, then explain and go into it. Because, yeah, if I just come out with a character and I just say, oh, he's schizophrenic, that's why he's doing this thing, you know, you have every right to, like, eh, I don't, I don't like that. Like, that's, you know, and if you have that reaction and you don't have any of these symptoms, you know, maybe somebody who does might have an even stronger reaction to it. You know, so yeah. it's always kind of feel out those, you know, things. Yeah, because because for all you know, somebody at the table might have that disorder and yeah. you just don't know it. And they have no no responsibility to tell you that they have. Of course it. not. So, yeah, anything that you could do to spare someone the potential embarrassment of feeling like they are being mocked, mm-hmm. even unintentionally. Anything you can do to avoid that is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely something that I think we as people are, you know, we're we're all learning. I think uh, someday it'll be easier to to deal with these sorts of things to um, to deal with the reactions to these sorts of things. But for the time being, I think uh, for a lot of people, it's it's hard to know exactly what you should be doing. Yeah. So it's better to err on the side of talking with everybody and making it making sure it's cool with everybody beforehand. Yeah. yeah. There, there's a lot of. Um... A lot to be said about exposure to these things, as yeah. I, being in the medical field, come into contact with these all the time. Like, we had mm-hmm. a girl who had a severe brittle bone disease, and she was all in her wheelchair, and I, you know, just said, oh, it's a horrible thing that they've, you know, done this to this poor girl, kept her alive through all this. And then she turns around and asks for, a, you know, a drink of milk, like any normal kid. And I was like, oh. Uh, I had so many preconceived notions of this and, you know, I'm wrong, you know, so the yeah. more you're exposed to it, the more, you know, you talk about it, the easier it will be. And so it's very good on, uh, you know, the main core books to now have, you know, disabled writers writing new items, you know, changing sure. things up to put it in the game so it becomes more natural. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's easy for those who don't understand it and aren't exposed to it to shove it aside as you know something that's just not there or you know it's 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 yeah. it's easy to kind of just ignore it but like you don't don't ignore their their people so don't ignore them like don't yeah, you know sure. don't you want to you want to respect them like any other person and so like you know having it be a part of you know a part of normal interactions even in your fantasy game <laughs> Yeah. You know, is, is, a, is, I think is a step in the right direction. Yeah. And that actually makes me think like, let's say one of the characters in some famous actual play podcast was, let's say they did have schizophrenia and it was said to be schizophrenia to an extent. If it's, if it's done well, that could be a very good thing because it would expose a bunch of people to schizophrenia or, you know, whatever other mental disorder in a way that would get them to be more accepting of it. If that's the end result, I'm I'm absolutely for it. So in that regard, maybe it's okay to call it what it is instead of just the set of symptoms, but at the same time I just I feel like the chances of it being done well. Yeah. I don't know. I don't I don't have much faith that yeah, people can do it well. Yeah. That, that's always the end thing like the yeah, you have the goal that's there, but the execution <laughs> Right. Yeah, cuz like no two people with with the same disability are the same because they're different. They're two different people. Like sure. yes, they have the same disability, but they're different people. So it's, it's you know you can't really like like you were saying like the definitions for everything is is only you know is is an ongoing thing. Like it's like you know, underst- understanding disabilities is an ongoing thing. So yeah. like un- you know unless you have perfect understanding of the disability, you probably shouldn't be the one speaking on it or speaking for it. Sure. But that also kind of leads to the thing where, unless you're like the guy who wrote the book, then can you talk about it at all? Like you don't want to go to that extreme either. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I I guess the lesson here is that <laughs> you know it is a difficult subject to to talk about. Yeah. But try and just be understanding. Try and be open. And I don't think anybody is going to blame you for wanting to try something different. Just be respectful. Yeah. You know, 
maybe if you are on an actual play podcast and you're going to be reaching a huge a huge audience, yeah. maybe talk to somebody who is an expert on this sort of thing and, and make sure you're doing it well. Yeah. But if it's yeah. just in a home game, yeah, just talk to everybody else in the group and and you know the the best you can do is your best. Yeah. Know your audience. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if I can actually point out one thing that I think uh, didn't do a great job with something like this, uh, the most recent season of the Adventure Zone recently ended a couple weeks ago, and I'm I'm remembering back to the very first episode of it where the characters are being introduced to you know, approximately 600 named characters. And they're introduced to this one character who is a, a I think she's an, a necromancer, but she's in a wheelchair. Or in a, not a wheelchair, but like a, some sort of a, you know, a floating, levitating magical chair. And like the first words out of her mouth are like, hey, you want to know how I got this chair? And it's just, to me as a listener, it felt like that's all this character is. Right. True that that character had some more traits that came up later on, but the first thing, first and only thing that character did in the first episode was talk about her disability. And uh, like, you're saying that a woman who can summon the dead isn't being carried by a skeleton <laughs> palanquin? Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, yeah that that would have been that would have been a. That would have been an improvement, yeah. I guess. So my legs don't work, but I can summon a skeleton <laughs> boy over here to carry me around. That's, what's wrong with that? <laughs> that is actually pretty good. Okay, so the next character. Yeah, <laughs> it's not even a, not even a, a necromancer with a disability, just a necromancer yeah, that's go. just carried around on a. Yeah, just <laughs> she just doesn't she just doesn't feel like walking. Today, like. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. So so yeah. Um, like I said, just talk, talk to your players and uh, talk to your players, talk to your co-players, talk to everybody else in your group and, you know, just be respectful and be open. Just get out there and talk to people. <laughs> Dustin, you had a, a list of characters in popular fiction that have some sort of a disability that you wanted to to use as examples, right? Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, the ones we came up with uh, was Drax, who you mentioned. Uh, okay. A big one uh, that you wouldn't think about, Rogue. Okay. Uh, Rogue cannot touch people, and sure, there are a yeah. lot of people that, for whatever reason, cannot come into contact with other people. Maybe it's immunocompromised, or they just they just don't like touching. So that sure, could sure. be considered a disability. Um, Cyclops uh, kind of falls into the blind thing, where he always has to have some apparatus on his head, lest he harm other people. You know, yeah. there's always that item that you have to carry around. Um, Odo from Deep Space Nine has to have a very specific ritual every 18 hours. He has to go back into his That's... jar, otherwise he starts to fall apart. There are a lot yeah, of people that have that. to take medications on certain cycles every so often. Uh, it would be interesting to have a character that had to carry around potions at all times. And if they ever ran out of those potions, maybe something happens. Maybe they you know, lose control, turn into a werewolf. Who knows? Um, sure. <laughs> Uh, another one was Professor X. Yeah. Always has the hover chair going around for a lot of the animated series, but there's always that moment in whenever the X-Men get attacked where that wheelchair gets damaged. It's almost one of the first yeah. things. And so this, like, Omega-level mutant is brought to his knees because, you know, he can't walk. And so... Yeah. Um, there's always these kind of ideas that even if you're giving the the character power to be able to sort out their disabilities, you should always remember there's going to be that you know moment where it comes to that interesting character decision where that help is going to be taken away and they're brought back down to that disability. And yeah. that's always a good place for character growth. What do they do in that situation? You know, do they drag themselves yeah. across the floor or do, do they, you know, stay there and ask for help? Like, what happens? Yeah, a flaw that never comes into play is not interesting. But a flaw that the character is able to, it has to overcome yeah. in order to achieve what they are what they need to achieve. That is interesting. Yeah, I think that should go with every character. Every character should have something, you know. Uh, whether it's some fear they have, whether it's some deep secret they have to overcome, or merely mm -hmm. the fact that they don't have a left foot, you know, that sure. should come into play at some point, you know. 
you know, to have an interesting yeah. story, interesting choice. You also had you had Doctor Strange on this list, oh. and I, when I first saw that, I was like, Doctor Strange wasn't what's, yeah. what's his disability? But no, his his hands are yeah. horribly injured. That was actually a uh, bad example of a okay. uh, a character with a disability because it never comes into play. Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> he at the very beginning of it, it goes. He has a car crash. He loses control of his hands. And mm -hmm. basically through his magic is able to regain control of everything, is able to fly around, teleport, and it's never considered again. Except yeah. in like that weird case in like comic series X19 <laughs> and like the cross century thing that no one reads. Um, but yeah, it's okay. one of those situations where like he has this disability, but it never comes up. It's almost as if yeah. like 90% of people... When they think of Doctor Strange, they think of him magicking up a weird orange disc thing, you know, causing a sling ring, moving his hands just fine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, I, it was more just like a, a a writing tool to, to like, yeah. you know, like, take away his old life to give him a new life. Because, yeah. like, sure. he was a master surgeon, and so, like, he needed very particular movement of his hands, not just the use of his hands, yes. but, like... Like he was able, they were able to like, like he was able to make it so he can use his hands, but not the way that he used to use his hands. Yeah, sure. And so he had to like change his life from then on or whatever. But yeah, it's still not, yeah, it's still not the, but I don't know. Can yeah. you imagine a Dr. Strange who still had to deal with the fact that his hands didn't work all the time? And I think yeah. there's a character class for it. It's the Chaos Mage. Oh, okay. Because think if he's trying to cast a spell and doesn't get the hand motion quite right and yeah. casts it too powerful, less than powerful, or whatever, and so you constantly have him dealing with that and maybe over the, the course of his character art getting more and more control of his hands. Mm -hmm. You know, so you always have that interesting kind of spice to it where he can try really hard or there's like the – he likes the spells that only have the verbal component. Or he likes yeah. the spells where he, you know, ha has, like, only one little bit where, it, like, it only is healing somebody. So you don't have to worry about blowing them up by mistake. Sure. But mm. I think a, you know, Mr. Strange that had difficulty using his hands would be a more interesting character. Yeah, I agree. Um, there was, we didn't, I don't think they ever actually played with us, but we have a friend that was going to be playing a game well going to be playing a character in a campaign I was running a bunch of years ago where this character had grown up on this like very regimented schedule and they were a monk that like they had to make this partic this particular food at specific times every day and if they didn't they would like start to suffer penalties or something hmm. and it very much did strike me as like a a an OCD style you know, just a personality trait, I guess, rather than, Ooh. I don't know. All right. I, I know it's slightly off topic, but I have yeah. several Muslim friends and they have to pray oh, five okay. times a day. Yeah. Like that would be an interesting thing for a character. Like they have specific prayers, you know, maybe not five times a day, but I know like in the Baldur's Gate games, there's a monitor, the God of the sun. You have the morning okay. prayer, you have the high noon prayer and you have the night prayer. Sure. So there'd be very interesting kind of things where, like, I don't care what's going on with everything else. I have to pray at this specific time, and I have to know sure. which direction things are. Otherwise, you know, maybe I don't get my spells back. Maybe, you know, I start to take points of exhaustion or something, where if sure. I don't do exactly this specific thing at a specific time... Yeah, that's definitely a thing that could uh, come up. Not saying that being a Muslim is anything to do with mental disability or physical <laughs> right, disability. Right. Sure. Hey, not being able to eat bacon is a disability. <laughs> Let me be honest right well, there. Well, there's a hot take. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, did you guys have anything else for, uh, for either of these, these two questions? No. No. Okay. All right. I think that'll do it for our regular questions for today. Uh, but we do still have our social media questions. Our last social media question was, have you ever been in a group where one or more PCs had a sidekick or follower? If so, tell us about it. Uh, Dustin, did you have uh, 
this kind of an experience? I think the most I ever did was I had a sorcerer uh, with a um, a f- pet familiar that talked. Okay. So, uh, unfortunately, everybody hated the bird and tried to kill him <laughs> on a regular basis. So a oh, no. good deal of the characterization for it was attempting to protect the bird from the blown darts from the rogue. Okay. Oh, no. Uh, and Jeff, did you, uh, I know you had a, a cohort at one point. Was that uh, what you brought up last time? Yeah, yeah. It was, uh, uh, his name was New Guy. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> he was the new guy. Yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, I had a, I, yeah, I took the leadership feat in third edition. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, yeah, I had a, uh, he was a monk cleric who took the prestige class sacred fist. Yeah. I've had a cohort a couple times. Um, in that same campaign, I had a nimble, right? Basically a, a gunslinging nimble, right? As my cohort. I also had a, a cleric that had a fighter cohort previously, um, and, uh, but then also when I was playing as my character, Ichi early on in the campaign, just, uh, some little commoner came up and was like, Hey, I want to be an adventurer like you. I want to, I want to go with you guys and go on adventures. And so he, he came along with us. It didn't necessarily end well, but, uh, for, for the rest of the campaign leading up to there, it was, uh, it's pretty cool. We had, <laughs> had a little follower guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Yeah. Uh, that was, those were ours on Facebook. I don't think we got anybody on Facebook. That's, that's not usual. Yeah, we didn't, sorry, we didn't get anybody on Facebook. Uh, over on Reddit, we got a couple. Pruno says, our group's monk saved a street urchin that was forced to rub butter on himself by a large pig demon preparing to cook him. Afterwards, the urchin asked to be trained by him showed up at the last adventure as a mini-me and fought robots at another PC's wedding together. Huh. I I feel unclean. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, So I I replied to this, there are so many things in that paragraph. (laughs) (laughs) Larison on Reddit says, Oh boy, my time has come. I believe that either I or my scratched out idiot boyfriend Alistar the Minotaur have mentioned my Pathfinder character Captain Calderosa on this podcast before. She was a Nagaji blood rager who operated a smuggling ship. At the beginning of the game, she had lost all of her crew in an unfortunate mutiny incident, which definitely wasn't her fault at all. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> However, Calderosa was hell-bent on getting back on the open sea behind the helm of a ship. As soon as I was able, I took the leadership feat. My DM ran with it. My cohort ended up being the only member of my old crew who tried to stick up for me in the mutiny. She was a druid who specialized in crafting potions. She made all kinds of potions for the party and would turn into a giant octopus and start grabbing enemies and dragging them overboard in a pinch. This was obviously cool, but it got even cooler when the party was tasked with disrupting a ring of slavers, from whom we proceeded to steal the finest ship. All of a sudden, I had a boat and a crew to man it. I worked with the DM to create names and at least a couple sentence description of all 38 of them. Hmm. I had so much fun coming up with the most ragtag, misfit crew I could come up with. Some highlights include a Dampier daywalker named Dagger, who looked remarkably like Wesley Snipes, (laughs) a merfolk paladin with no sense of humor, and a world-class chef named Ramsey Bourdain. It was honestly oh. probably the most fun I've ever had playing a tabletop RPG. <laughs> and go. then uh, actually, Alistar the Minotaur replied to that saying, and Krilla was her first mate. Definitely because he endeared himself to the good captain and also because he was unquestionably the best person for the job. Heck, he probably should have just been the captain, but in his infinite wisdom, he let his good friend take the reins. Why do I feel that Alistar played Krilla? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know I don't, yeah i get that impression too but who knows who knows uh we also did not get any on twitter and we got a few on discord stiltskin coop 84 says og er ever the life of the party became so famous thanks to leo the bard that he attracted five followers of various elvish descents and classes one of those followers the drow bard nil who trained under leo became my very next pc Nil had one follower, a female drow he recruited from a brothel. Sarah the Red was so lanky and boyish that she'd been the least successful lady under the madam. 
She was thus relegated to the role of being the hidden knife lady, whose room one could pay to make sure someone never walked out of. Nil almost met that very same fate, but with his bardic charm, filled her head with dreams of life on the road. So they carved a path of blood out of the house of the madam, and Nil kept his promise to make her adventures on the road with him thrilling and psychotic, until the dragonborn paladin PC stuck a sword through her, ending the campaign in some good old-fashioned ding interparty conflict. <laughs> Those darn paladins. <laughs> yep. Uh, Collins B says, currently running my Acquisitions Incorporated party through Descent into Avernus. We currently have three sidekicks. The obviator Legrina adopted a direwolf cub. The cartographer Elira befriended a Tresum. And the party as a whole has taken on Rhea, a Hellrider NPC, as a follower. Due to the nature of the adventure being in, well, hell, I as a DM did not want to deal with killing my party's pets or BS the story to dump the animals off on someone who can take care of them. So I went to Tasha's Cauldron and used the sidekick rules to beef up the stat blocks of these three. The direwolf cub and Rhea became warriors, and the Tressum became an expert. So now they have far less chance of dying, and give the PCs controlling them some more fun to do during combat. So yes, last week we talked about the sidekick rules, which are amazing. Yeah. Go use them, everyone, right now. <laughs> the mimic should be a party member and it should fight with the weapons that are stored inside it <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> i will go, i will go to war over that <laughs> mrv 73 says in the game i dm for kids after they defeated the red brands they took on the goblin droop as their sidekick and major domo for their lair he's currently a ranger that has hired other local goblins to work as the party's in lair staff fixing the place up I've also added in a mysterious dimensional rift that has opened up and a mysterious benefactor that has given them the map to Wave Echo Cave and mission to secure the Spellforge there. As until this point, they were wandering around the wilderness after the Thunder Tree encounter. Um, and then I'll just read one more. Lone Wolf Nateman says, My first time DMing a full modules campaign, my players were in a bad way, and I had made a cleric character a while beforehand. And I had him randomly show up and everyone was like, WTF, who's this guy? So I didn't use him again. He was a hill dwarf cleric named Flint Baldurk. He didn't die or anything, but they didn't seem to like the stalker cleric, so I stopped using him to like them. That campaign module, Horde of the Dragon Queen, ended up going a little sideways, and they fought some mini-bosses they weren't supposed to until further into the book. So now they're OP level 3s, and I have to figure out how to get the story somewhat back on track now that they have these great magic items. But I never sat down to work it out. Anyway, I let them get away with too much, trying to let them feel like they were free to do whatever. But I rolled with what they were doing, and then I was like, well, I screwed this game up. Time for a new one. And I started them in Waterdeep Dragon Heist, and now they're in level one of Undermountain in Dungeon of the Mad Mage. So there you go. That's, uh, that's a lot of stuff. Sometimes when you use a, a, a sidekick or something, sometimes it's not necessary. So yeah. good on Lone Wolf Nateman for at least recognizing that, you know, when it wasn't... Uh, when it wasn't welcome, I guess. Now I want to make a stalker cleric. That sounds fun. <laughs> sure. <laughs> a cleric that just hides in the shadows and heals people from a distance. Secret blessings for everybody. <laughs> I bless you and I bless you. All right. So that was our last social media question. Thank you, everybody who wrote in. Our next social media question is, have you ever had a character lose a limb or suffer some kind of permanent injury? If so, how did it happen? Mm. Uh, Jeff and Dustin, have either of you had such a thing happen? I had a character. He was a geometric mage that used runes to cast a spells, and he once cast one backwards and blew his ear off and refused to have it heal back so that he would oh. always remember the mistake he made. Okay. So he was deaf on one side. Okay, interesting. Uh, Jeff, have you ever had a character like that? I can't remember. I don't think so. No. Um, yeah, none, none that I can think of. Okay. Um, I haven't had a character with like a, a physical injury. Uh, my character Artemis Red Sleeves, I decided that when he was killed and then brought back from the dead, I decided like he had terrible PTSD from it, but uh, mm. it's not. that's not quite the same thing, I guess. Oh, I, I guess my Age of Worms character had a scar, but he didn't, like, lose the limb completely or anything like that. He just yeah. had a really big scar on his arm. Sure. 
Uh, yeah. So, uh, so I'm, I'm interested to see if any of our listeners have had something like that. I know that I've talked in the past at length about the, uh, long-term madness, long-term injury tables, those sorts of things. So hopefully somebody, somebody out there has gotten some use out of those, I guess. Yeah. All right. I think I'll do it for all of our questions for today, but, uh, before we close out, let's, let's wind down. Let's take a deep breath. (sighs) <sighs> Let's remember those who have come before us, who have given their lives and their limbs so that we may have a better world to live in as we toss another log onto the funeral pyre. Today's funeral pyre was submitted by Captain Clyde 7 on Reddit. And they said, Old school D&D, the party was being pursued by six angry orc hunters belonging to a lair we just massacred and took their treasure. The orcs were slowly gaining on us, and after a nerve-wracked day and night on the run, two characters in the group realize they're faster than the dwarf and human. So they basically just speed-walked away as the other two slowly fell behind, shouting for them to wait up, which soon turned into horrific screams of slow death by orc torture in the distance. Poor Winston and Seamus. <laughs> oh, no. Oh. So, yeah, that's uh, sucks to be Winston and Seamus, I guess. That's, that's rough. You don't have to <laughs> outrun the orcs. You just have to outrun the dwarf. Clank. Clank. All right. So thank you very much, Dustin, for uh, coming on the show. It's been a pleasure. Would you once again like to just tell our listeners uh, where they can find you if, they, if they'd like to? Yeah. Uh. I'm on Twitter at med school daddy, M E D school daddy, on Twitter, yeah. and also on our Discord. Yeah, you are, I'm, I'm usually you are on, on there. there. Uh, uh, cool. Thank you very much, Dustin, for coming on the show. To everybody else, uh, you can submit questions for us to discuss, items for the Dragon's Horde, or stories for the Funeral Pyre. You can email us at interpartyconflict at gmail dot com. For show notes, links to media mentioned on the show. And running lists of questions and magic items, go to interpartyconflict.com. Join the discussion on social media. We're on Facebook. We're on Reddit. We're on our Interparty Discord. We're on Twitter at InPartyConflict. Check those out for our weekly social media questions. Your answers might end up on the show. You can find us on the podcatcher of your choice. We're on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, Spotify, anywhere you download podcasts. Please rate, review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you'd like to support the show monetarily, check out the rewards at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. We have a few different tiers, so anything you can spare, even a dollar a month, would go towards making the show better, and you'll get bonus content for it. Jeff, tell us about FriendQuest. FriendQuest is a YouTube channel where you can watch us play video games. Yes. Also head over to bit.ly slash interpartyconflict to take a short survey about our show what you like, what you don't like, etc. And just for taking it, you'll get two free printable board games, courtesy of Mary and Tom over at hollandspiel.com. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, until next time... Oh, my wallet was in my other pocket. <laughs> Wait, what? What was... Oh, okay. I... Okay. That's, That's amazing. Good. Yes. <laughs> 